Good evening, everybody. Lovely to have you all joining this evening. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you. My name is Anne, and I'm going to be your tutor for this session and for the subsequent Principles of Bookkeeping Control sessions over the next week or so. Special welcome to those that are joining live, although I appreciate some of you will be listening to this recording at home. Um, so what we're going to be doing is we are going to be starting our session this evening, having a look at some control accounts. And I do that because I think it's a really good sort of starting point as revision for this unit, really sort of recapping on some double entry, making sure that we understand how the debits and credits are going to affect our control account entries. And control accounts are going to be tested within your assessment within tasks one and two. And um, so we're actually going to start our chat this evening with a task number one involving some control account questions. So just going to mention in our pack of revision questions, what you will see, this is page five here, before the questions for each task, we have something that we like to call a task briefing. And the task briefing takes me through some of the key knowledge that would be necessary to deal with a task number one in the exam. So this is really useful if you feel a little bit rusty on control accounts, say, at some point in your own time, you might like to read through that task briefing and treat that section like a little set of revision notes. I think that would be really helpful, potentially to get you back up to speed if you're feeling it's been a little while since you've looked at this. Or maybe you feel that you've never really understood it and you could do with a bit more help. Well, there you go. A little bit of a briefing to get you going, explaining what control accounts are about. I'm not going to do it now because we're actually going to talk about them as we make our way through the actual question here. But it's perhaps something that you might like to do at home. Just open some more paper just in case. And then we will get going. Right. So here we are, task number one, then as an example, in the assessment, this task is worth 10 marks. What does it tell me? It says here is a summary of transactions to be recorded in the VAT control account. So straight in there, probably with what I would consider to be one of the more tricky control accounts. So here is a summary of transactions. It's a list, really, of transactions that need to be recorded in the VAT control. And part A says, what will be the entries in the VAT control to record the above VAT transactions? Well, what I would just like to revise with you is how I might tackle this sort of task. So the first thing that I would be tempted to do is maybe just sketch out on my workings paper a little VAT account. And what I may do on that VAT account is just remind myself how it works. And remind myself that what happens with VAT is that if I need to increase the amount that is owing to revenue and customs, I would do that on the credit side. So to increase the VAT owing, I'd be looking at credits. Of course, credits is always over here. And the debit is always over there on the left. So things that increase the VAT that I owe, can you give me any examples? What sort of transactions might increase the amount of VAT that I need to pay to revenue and customs? What increases the amount of VAT? Yes, very, very good. So that's a brilliant start. And that's exactly what I was hoping you might say. Things like sales. There could be cash sales, there could be credit sales, it doesn't matter. Sales will increase the amount of VAT that we owe because as we make the sale, the customer gives us some money. When we get the money from the customer, they give us the money that's actually for us and the money that is for the revenue and customs. So we collect some of that, it's not actually ours to keep, so it becomes a liability, becomes VAT that we owe to revenue and customs. So sales do increase the VAT that we owe. As I said, they could be both cash or credit sales. Now, this side of the account then, in some ways, is the opposite because this would decrease the VAT that's owing. 
this means that I am actually almost reclaiming VAT from revenue and customs. I'm asking for some VAT back. I'm saying this is going to reduce anything that I might owe having made those sales. So the sort of thing I might see over here, I would suggest you might start with the opposite of sales, which you could say then is purchases. So again, you make purchases for cash, you make purchases on credit, both of those will reduce the amount of VAT that you owe. Now we're not gonna fill this in in its entirety, but I think as you get more familiar with the style of questions, I do think when you have a control account question, it's a very nice idea to start by putting together just a few entries into a control account on your blank paper, just to help remind you and to get you started. Because if you can get started, then I think the rest of it can actually flow into place. And what we've done already there is going to be helpful. We could fill in lots more, but it might ruin our question. So I'm not going to fill in more. I would suggest perhaps as you get to the live assessment, you may be able to fill in a little bit more on your working sheet, which will then help you when you come to answer the question. So let's bear in mind things, transactions that are going to increase the VAT that we owe are going to go on the credit side. And transactions like purchases that are going to decrease what we owe are going to go over there on the debit side. So bearing that in mind, we're now going to have a look at these various transactions and get them into our control account. So the first one is the VAT total in the sales day book. Well, we did revise that one, didn't we? It's a very common one to be tested. And we said, well, if you made a sale, you owe more VAT. So it's got to go over there on the credit side. And looking at my VAT control, I'm actually starting off here with a liability. It's on the credit side. So it means that we owe money to revenue and customs right from day one. But then we've made these sales. So I've got my sales day book, £85,000. Suggesting I owe even more VAT. I've made a sale. The customer's given me the money, not my money to keep. I owe it to revenue and customs. So we can give that one a little tick once we've got it into our control. Now, what about the sales returns day book? Do you think what side might that go on? The opposite side. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yes. And that's a great way to remember it because if making a sale increases the VAT that you owe, then surely having customers return some of those goods has got to have the opposite effect. So we increase the VAT owing over here. But if the customers then bring those goods back and say, actually, didn't fit, didn't like them, want to bring them back, that must surely reduce the VAT owing. So the sales day book is like the opposite of the sales returns day book. So it has to go on the opposite side. And the sales returns day book had £3,000 of that in there. So they sort of almost live together, but just on opposite sides of the account, polar opposites of each other. So if you can do one, you can do the other. That's the point I'm getting at. Now, if this was me in the exam uh, and I was reading down this list and I came to something that said discounts, I would probably skip it. And I would think I'll come back to that. There's got to be some nicer things than discounts. OK, very good question, Linda. What would actually happen in the live assessment is that you would have a drop down list. So you wouldn't be typing this in freehand in the live assessment. You would be using a pick list. So the pick list might say sales, in which case that's what you'd pick. It might say credit sales. So you'd pick that. It might say sales there, but you'd pick that. So what we're really concentrating on this evening is that you know what side to get things on. So in the actual live assessment, it will be a pick list. It won't just be you trying to dream up ideas from, um, from memory. So you'd pick from the predetermined list. But that was a very good question. OK, so I'll probably skip the discounts and see if there was something nicer. So next are purchases. So we've got VAT on cash purchases. I've got VAT on petty cash payments as well. So I've got two types 
of cash payments, some paid out of the bank and some paid out of the uh, petty cash. What side do you think I'd put those on? Where might I put payments? Any thoughts on that one? On the debit side as well. Yes, remember our little summary. It decreases the VAT that's owing because you've already paid the VAT. When you make a payment, let me just remind you how you would make a payment. You would credit your cash account, let's say with £120. You would then debit the purchasers, so the cost of the goods that you've actually bought, with 100 And then you'd say, ah, oh, but actually you've made me pay 120 so I've had to pay for the goods and I've had to pay for the VAT as well. So because I've already paid it, I can now reclaim it. So I need to put it on the debit side of my account. So you can use a little double entry and create it on your workings paper, as I did here, if you think that's helpful. You might not need to. So if not, we can go straight in here with our cash purchases and our petty cash payments. So the cash amount, the cash purchases were 1,000 and the petty cash was 500. So get both of those onto the debit side. I've paid that VAT already when I made the actual payment. So now <laughs> I'm able to reclaim it in effect. And what about the purchaser's day book? Where would that one go? Same side. For the same reason, it's more purchases. You're not paying for them straight away, but they are just simply more purchases. So let me just abbreviate it. The purchase day book or purchases would go to the debit side and the VAT on purchase day book items was 25,000, quite significant there. So get that one in. And then I would always try to do the purchase returns when I do the purchases. So even if they're not together on the list, I'm gonna look for the purchase returns book because I like to do it next to the purchases because it is the opposite. So just like the purchase day book, sorry, the sales day book lived with the sales returns day book, they were opposites. My purchase day book and my purchase return day book also can be done at the same time because I reclaim the VAT on things that I purchased I then return some of them and said, well, don't want them. They're rubbish, took them back. And I therefore have to give back some of the that that I've reclaimed. So then that one's done. Oh, we've got some more cash sales at the end. I might skip that one for now because that looks a bit messy. Let's leave that one. Let's do the easy ones. The VAT on the cash sales, well, where are all my other sales? The credit sales were over here on the credit side. So surely the cash sales go on the same side. It's just that I purchased things, uh, sorry, sold things for cash rather than on credit. But the same idea, VAT is owing to revenue and customs. So we credit the VAT control. So that leaves me with the two more complicated or a bit more messy entries. First one being VAT payment made to HMRC. So I've actually taken money out of my bank account and I have paid off some of the VAT owing. What side of my VAT account would that go on? Exactly right. Well done. And if you struggle to remember that one, think, well, oh, I've made a payment. What happens when I make a payment? And remind yourself, if you make a payment, you have to credit the cash. Because you've spent money. So you've got to then debit the VAT. The other reason that we debit the VAT is because you've made a payment now. And if you made a payment, you're decreasing what's owing because you've just paid off some of your liability. So the cash paid, probably just be cash or something similar. I just want to uh, make a little note for you so you remember. So it, it would be cash, but it's what would pay to HMRC. And it was 55,000 and I'm putting that on the debit side to represent the VAT that I have paid. 
Now, with this little example that we've got here, you can see I've only got one space left, which makes the discounts part quite easy. But we're also going to talk about why this goes here. It's a discount received daybook. Who do I receive discounts from? Who gives me discounts? Why do, why do I get discounts? They come from suppliers, don't they? Absolutely right. So if the supplier gives me a discount, what they're saying is, great that you're working with us, really enjoy you being our customer because you paid early perhaps, you don't have to pay so much, we'll give you a discount. So when they give us a discount, they reduce the amount that we need to pay. So we debit our payables account with, let's say, the numbers so I can manage them, let's say 12 pounds. So our discount in total is 12 pounds. And they say, of that 12 pound, the actual discount that we're giving you is 10. But because there's VAT on everything, there's two pounds of VAT on there. So we reduce the amount that we need to pay to our supplier by debiting the payable. We credit the discount because this is actually our income. And we credit the VAT here to increase our liability here. We've received a discount, any sort of receipt, a receipt from a customer, a receipt from a cash sale. Any receipt ends up with a bit of VAT. This just happens to be the receipt of a discount. So it increases the liability. It increases what we owe because somebody's given us something for nothing. So we're going to have that on the credit side of our account there. And it was um, £150. So 150 in there for a discount received. And of course, it follows that if you had a discount allowed, that that would go over the other side of the account. So I would start off with any discount question by firstly thinking, who does this discount impact? Is it a discount relating to suppliers or is it a discount relating to customers? Then I think it just makes me a little bit easier for me to sort of navigate my head around it in terms of working out if it's a debit or a credit. And often you'll see, I think about the other side of the double entry too. So I didn't do that with all of these, but the tricky ones, I'll think about the full double entry to try to give myself a better chance of getting it right by working out the other sides of the debit and credit as well. And that was it for that one. It didn't ask us to balance it off. That one, it just said, put the entries in. So that was the end of it. No balance carried down, no totals, just entries in the VAT control, which we've done. So out of the 10 marks available in this question, that's actually eight of them already complete. So the bulk of the question is actually done already. So we've got a couple of bits left, each just worth one mark each. The next part being this one, that Dilly has the following receivables ledger control. And what I would like you to note about this account is that a receivables control account is an asset because it represents money owing to us from our customers. So when it's an asset account, that means that the balance increases. So we increase the asset on the debit side. An asset is a good thing for us. People owe us money. So if we make sales, People owe us money, so that increases the asset. More customers owe us money. And over here, we'd reduce the asset. If the customers return things, then they owe us less. If we give them a discount, the discount allowed. We allow the customers a discount, they owe us less. Or they pay us and we put the money in the bank, then they owe us less. So there's lots of reasons that we reduce the balance as well. What this question wants, that was just all my extra little bit of revision there, what the question actually wants is to know what is the balance carried down on the receivables ledger control account. So it's saying, what is this figure? How do I work that out? Maybe to remind me, how do I find that balance carried down figure? Maybe you would like, would like to work it out for me. Pop your answer in the chat box when you've got one.
more light on my solar calculator here. Oh, it's not actually. It's better. Yes, good. Work out the totals, find out which is the largest total. Thank you very much. That is exactly how we balance the accounts off. And it's very important that you know that. So I have found the total over here to be 136,010. And I found that to be the largest because the other side didn't add up to quite that much which means that that becomes 136,010 as well, because the largest total dictates the totals. What I then do is that I find what we call the balancing figure. Whatever is needed to make the smaller side add up. So I need this side to add up to 136,010. And I got 7644. If you agree with that, is that what you think that we needed to make it add up? Yep, Rachel's agreeing. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Zazana, there as well for your workings with that one. Excellent. So, a couple of things I'd like to say about this too the balance carried down is needed to make the account add up because we're accountants. We love the account to add up. It just wouldn't sit right if it didn't add up, we'd be in a cold sweat. So we need the account to add up. That is the purpose of the balance carried down. What figure is needed to make it add up? If somebody says to you, what is the balance on the receivables control account? Well, it is 7644, that is very true, but it's actually 7644 debit balance. So if you were preparing a trial balance, what figure would you put on your trial balance? And the answer would be 7644 debit. So you've got to always read the question carefully. It might just say what is the balance on the account, in which case it's 7644. If it comes up in the context of what figure needs to go in your trial balance, then it's 7644 debit. Because the 7644 on the credit side is simply there to make everything add up, but the debit side was bigger. There are more debits than there were credits. So overall, this account has more debits, therefore it has a brought down balance on the first day of the next period of 7644. So this particular question just said, what is the balance carried down? So I go with 7644, but I just wanted to use that opportunity to remind you when you do get onto those later tasks, which will be um, seven and eight, I think, involving the trial balance, um, where you've got to appreciate that it is the brought down figure that determines the actual account balance. Is that all right with anybody? Any questions? You can pop them in the chat box if you have any. Otherwise, we'll just finish off with part C. All good, thank you so much. So one, one mark here. This one says a payables ledger control account balance is shown in the general ledger. A payables ledger control. Payables ledger, that's how much we owe to our suppliers. So this payables ledger account is what I would call a liability. It shows the amount that you owe to your suppliers. And it's showing in the general ledger. And the question wants to know which one of the following is correct in relation to this payables ledger control. So let's just have a read through the options. A payables ledger control account shows the total amount owed to the business from credit customers. Now that's a problem, isn't it? Because it doesn't actually talk about credit customers. It talks about suppliers. So that is definitely wrong. It's the credit customers part there makes it wrong. 
A payables ledger control enables the quick identification of an amount owed from a specific customer. There's two things wrong in there because certainly it doesn't deal with customers. So on that basis, I'm going to say it's wrong. But the control accounts also don't deal with specific people. They deal with totals. So that's wrong for two, two reasons. The payables ledger control should always be produced by the same person who does the subsidiary ledger because that improves the accuracy. Do you think that's a good idea to have the same people working on the control account that are working on the individual ledger? Do you think that's a good idea? Does that look like the right answer? No, it's not, is it? If you have that one person doing all the jobs in respect of payables, it's too easy for them to commit a fraud. What we are hoping to have is some segregation of duties, if you remember that phrase. So that looks like the wrong answer as well, because we ought to have segregation of duties. So now I have the last one here, and I'm hoping this is right because it's the last one that's left. A payables ledger control account shows the total amount owed to credit suppliers. That's what I was looking for. So that's the one I'm interested in. So it does show the total amount owed to my credit suppliers. OK. Any questions on that? Anything I can help with there? Which part, uh, Veronica? You think the whole question or just part C? Because I, I can imagine the first couple are perhaps a little bit obvious, but I don't know whether a few people might have gone for that one if they hadn't spotted the segregation of duties bit. But uh, you never know, do you? But it's good revision for us, isn't it? Hmm. And Onila, um, I'm not quite sure what your question is there. You said what happens when they leave or X? <laughs> if you want to elaborate on that, I'm happy to help. OK, so um, I think what we might do, we might not get the whole thing done. Let's see how uh, how much time you've got, because we've only got four sessions altogether for this bookkeeping controls unit. If you're happy to keep going, I'm happy to start to have a look at the next task with you. Um, task number two, it's another one dealing with control accounts. So we might not get it all done. We might just get some of it done. Should we see? But if you do have to slip away, it's not a problem because you've got the recording, haven't you? These materials are not on the AAT website, Lenka. These materials are the ones that I um, put in the chat box for you. Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you, Onila, for clarifying that. Good. So you're all good. So Lenka, um, yeah, these are the materials from First Intuition. They're mock number one. You do have extra questions on the AAT website that you can practice by all means. But these are our questions. Do you need me to pop them in? The OK, let me pop them in the box again then. Here they come. Just putting the questions back in the chat box. So if you download that file linker, then you will. Uh, you'll have access to them. So then well, as we go along, you'll be able to fill them in or work through this again with the recording if you prefer. So as before, there's another task briefing. We're looking at another 10 marks, so about 11 minutes to complete this one if it was a live exam. The task briefing is there. Look at it. I think they are super, super helpful if you're feeling a bit rusty on this topic. I'm just going to launch straight into the task with you and we'll see how we go. So this is a summary of transactions with suppliers during the month of June. Show whether each entry will be a debit or a credit in the payables ledger control account within the general ledger. So the payables ledger control account. Just like I did with the VAT, what I like to do in an exam is just a bit of something to calm myself down. Because sometimes when you read the various things it's telling you about, you get in such a muddle because you start doubting yourself. 
So now I know it's a payables control account it's asking me about. What I want to do is write down what I can remember. Before I read the question, I can remember that this account is a liability. And I can remember that that means to increase it, I do have to do some credit entries. So I increase my liability over here and I decrease my liability, reduce what I owe to the suppliers by doing debits in this account. So I expect to have things like purchases over here, which will increase what I owe. And I expect to have things like payments over here, which will reduce what I owe. So I personally like to just sketch out a rough payables control. And again, as you do this, as you get more and more confident, you'll be able to put more and more on there. And it's great practice anyway for revision, just to write out a payables control, put on as much as you can remember about it, ensuring you get stuff on the right sides. But even if you don't write out the whole thing, even if you just say, I remember that to increase the amount I owe to suppliers, I have to do credits and to decrease the amount I owe to my suppliers, I have to do some debits. If that's what you remember, then that's OK. I'd be all right with that. So now I've got that in my mind. Let me look at the question. So this is basically me now creating in a little list format here, a payables ledger control. So it's asking, where would I see these entries in my control? So if I was to fill that control in in full, where would I expect to see each of these items? So the balance owing to the credit suppliers on the 1st of June. So the first day of the month, where will that balance be on the debit or the credit side? Well done. On the credit, because it's a liability. Remember this? Liability account? Anything that makes the liability more is on the credit side. So you would start with the balance owing on that credit side. Excellent. Then for each of the others, you just have to think, does it increase what I owe or does it decrease what I owe? So that increases the balance outstanding. And this one decreases the balance outstanding. So the next one that is payments made to credit suppliers, what would you like to do with that one? Yes, Susanna, absolutely it would. Yes. And that was my point in labouring that with the previous example. So you know the difference. Exactly. Yes. So that would be a debit. So we've made a payment. It's a debit. Now we've got some returns here. I might not do the returns until I've done the purchases. I think I'd do purchases first just to get my head straight. So if I buy goods from a credit supplier, where would that go? When I make purchases, I buy things on the credit side. Absolutely. So keeping that in mind, if then some of those goods are returned, what side might they go on? The opposite one. Yes. So I increase my balance with credits and I decrease with a debit. So if some of the goods that I purchased have been returned, I do a debit. And then the last one, I have received a discount from my supplier. If I receive a discount from the supplier, do I owe them more money or do I owe them less money? That will then help you to determine whether you want a credit or a debit. You owe them less money. Excellent. So the discount is going to go on the same side as the payment. Because they say, actually, you don't need to make the payment will let you off with the money. So looking at the top of the column, I said, if you want to decrease the balance outstanding, you do a debit. This is a discount. Want to decrease what's showing is outstanding. So you do a debit. But you could put the full little double entry together if you wanted. As a reminder, I think we actually looked at it earlier. With a discount received, you could do the same thing with the discount. Oh, that was a discount received. Oh, yeah, perfect. So there it is. We did that with some different numbers, but uh, same idea. So we said we wanted to debit our payables because it reduces what we owe. Perfect. That's part A. That was five marks. 
The next question says then, what will be the balance brought down on the 1st of July on the above account? The brought down is crucial. On the 1st of July is crucial because the brought down and the carried down are going to be the same figure. It's just that one is a debit and one is a credit. So it's very, very important that I get that right. So what I would probably do, it might take an extra minute, but I think I'd do it anyway, is probably sketch the account. So balance owing 1st of June, we said it was a credit. So I'm gonna say balance brought down on the 1st of June was 16,000. I made some purchases. So I've got another credit of 18,500. So all of that increases what's owing. But then I made some payments of 14. I returned some goods that I didn't want to pay for of 500. And they gave me a discount, so I owed a little bit less of 1,000. And the reason that I would just recommend sketching it out like this rather than just putting it all straight through on the calculator is just as you're still learning, you might just have more chance of getting the carried down and the brought down in the right places if you're seeing it in full. So biggest total to both sides, just like we did before when we balanced the account off. Whatever you need to make it add up goes in here. And this is where you've got to be extra careful. That's the balance carried down. Not the balance brought down. But the question wants the brought down. This appears to be information for the month of June. Here we go. Transactions in June. So what do we owe at the beginning of June? What do we owe at the end of June? What we want to know is what is the balance brought down? So it goes on to the credit side of the account. It's a liability. There's far more on the credit side than on the debit side. So I need my 19,000 credit to get going. So then I can answer the question. So if you think that's a long way around and you think, oh, I don't need to do all that, I could have just added it through on the calculator. I am perfectly happy that you can do that. If you can see it clearly enough at this stage that you can just whiz it through on the calculator and know that it's going to be a credit, no problem with me. I'm just setting it out in a little bit more detail here for the benefit of, uh, of learning, benefit of revision, and for the benefit of those people that don't perhaps see it quite so quickly yet. So it just gives you an opportunity to revise the control account and think about how you'd actually get all the figures in there and what they carried down and brought down actually show us. Okay. Right, next bit quite good that we get to revise this too because we've now got a list of balances in the receivables ledger and it's very important that we understand the difference between the control account and the receivables ledger so because this is a revision course let me just remind you how things work so let's just say as an example that I have an invoice from A of 100 pounds so oh, let's say I invoice A, 100. I invoice B with 300 and I invoice C with 400. So I've sent invoices of 800 altogether. I only get cash from one of them. The cash comes in from C and they pay 300. So they're my transactions in the month. In my receivables control account, I would say, oh, I made some sales. 800 pounds of sales, that increases what the customers owe me. And I'm using the total from here to fill that in. Then I'd say, oh, actually I got some cash. One of the customers paid me. So I got some cash of 300. 
and I'm using the total from over here to fill that in. So the total and the total. So I can see quite clearly at that point that I have got a balance carried down of 500 pounds. 800 is the total, the biggest total. Got a balance brought down of 500. We've practiced balancing these things off now. So that's just another example. 500 pounds owing to me from my customers. Now, the point of the, this is the control account. The point of the receivables ledger is that this 500 here doesn't help me in terms of who should I be phoning, who still owes me money. All it tells me is in total, you have 500 pounds owing to you. It doesn't give me any clue at all as to who actually owes me the money. So alongside that, I keep a completely separate little book that we call the Memorandum Ledger. It has many names. It's a Memorandum Ledger. Or maybe we call it the Receivable Ledger. Receivables Ledger. It's known as a Subsidiary Ledger. That's its other term. It's like a memo. So I quite like the idea of it being a memorandum ledger, a reminder. It's not part of the double entry. It just keeps a little running total of each individual person. So when we need to phone them and say, hey, where's our money? We know who to ask for how much. So I'd have a separate account for each of my customers. And every time I made a sale, like I send an invoice to A, I'd put it on their account. So I'd say A, sold to you, £100. B, sold to you as well. What did I say for that one? £300. C, sold to you, £400. So I keep a running track of every individual customer. I then told you that it was only C that actually gave us any money. So C gave us cash of £300. So at the end of the period, I can now see exactly how much everybody owes me. C is the only one that actually had more than one transaction. And C owes me £100. B owes 300 and A owes 100 So that's the purpose of this memorandum ledger, is to keep a running total of every individual person. And what I hope at the end of the period is that I can add together my individual people. A, you owe me 100. B, you owe me 300. C, you owe me 100. So in the total between you, you owe me 500 pounds. Yes, correct. In total, everybody owes 500. So when I make my little list here to say A, 100, B, 300, and C, 100, they do indeed total 500. And that's what I'm always hoping for, that the amount in my list or my receivables ledger will equal the receivable ledger control account, because I'm doing exactly the same thing in both. The only difference is here, I'm doing one invoice and one cash payment at a time, and here, I'm putting everything in, in total, but I am doing exactly the same thing. OK, so because this is a revision session, just adding in all that bit of extra detail. Now, having done that, hopefully this question is a bit nicer. Let's look. Following balances are listed in the receivables ledger. So that's the list of the individual people we were just talking about. We've got Labrador. King Charles, Doberman, Jack Russell and Great Dane. But can you spot anything a bit funny about that list? Anybody in that list that I say jumps out at you? They're all dogs. Yep, <laughs> absolutely. That's why they're jumping out at us, Veronica. <laughs> uh, yeah, Doberman. Doberman is the one that jumps out at me, I think. And the reason it's jumping out at me is because 
it says the account is in credit. And remember, these are customers, they're supposed to owe me money. So it looks like there's a problem with Doberman. Maybe they paid me, forgot they'd paid me and paid me again. So they've ended up with a credit balance. They've ended up where I actually owe them money. So when I have to add this list up now, I add up all the debits and say, well, I've got three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 12,000 altogether in debits. So they're the people that owe me money. But I've got one person, Doberman, who's a credit and I owe them. So they must have paid me and forgotten and paid me again. So in total, I've actually only got 11,000 of debits because I've got to net off the 1,000 credits. So the balance on the receivables control account, in order for it to reconcile with that list, would need to say, overall, I'm looking at an 11,000 debit balance. And that would be the balance brought down on the 1st of August. Okay. Is that clear with everybody? You see what we're doing with that credit balance? We're recognizing it's not the same as the others. I've got a whole list of people that owe me money and then one person that's maybe paid twice, so I actually ended up owing them. So I've got to net them off with one another. Okay, so we're nearly done. Um, so that was part C. Part D, if the receivables ledger control account is greater then the total balances on the receivable ledger accounts, which three reasons could explain this? Three marks. And we've got to find three reasons. I think this is the hardest bit of this question. And that was one of the reasons that I did all this with you. It's one of the reasons that I reminded you about how this whole system works. So let's just imagine now then that we've done our control account and the control account shows with all its debits and credits, let's say um, it showed sales of a thousand and it's got cash of 300. It's got a balance of 700, just as an example. Because sometimes having a few numbers to look at just makes it a little bit easier rather than it just being completely theoretical. We've got 700 pounds owing from customers. Now, when I make my little list of those customers, it says that the balance on the list, that the control account is greater than the receivables ledger accounts. My list of A and B, maybe 300 and 300. So they're only showing 600. So it's saying, how could you explain that? Like what could have happened? What could have gone wrong to mean that the control account shows there's more outstanding? And the individual list does. That's what we've now got to understand. So we're looking for three, uh, three reasons that could explain the difference. We've got three correct answers and one that isn't the answer. So let's start at the beginning. Goods returned may have been entered twice in the receivables ledger. Whenever it says receivables ledger, my brain says list, just so I know where I am. So if goods were returned, and then we process that return again, would that make the list balance smaller than the control? I think it would, because if I return goods, I would show that my customer owes less money, and then I accidentally process that return again, so the customer now owes even less money. So I would think that that would make the list balance too low. So I think that that is one of the correct answers. So I'm going to pick that one. Next one. Goods returned may have been omitted from the receivables ledger. So I've got to forget the first one now. I want to call something completely different. Goods returned may have been omitted from the receivables ledger. So it's saying, if the customer returned the goods and you forgot to return them in the list, then the list would be showing 
too high a balance. I think if I'd forgot to return them, the list balance would be too high because it would be showing the goods are still at Owen where actually they've been returned. So I think that that's wrong because I think if the goods had been omitted, we hadn't processed the return, that this figure would be too high. So I don't think that's right. I'm going to say no for that one, which means the other two must be correct. But let's check. Sales invoices may be entered twice in the receivables ledger control account. Well, we're now into somewhere different, aren't we? We're now over here. Invoices may have been entered twice. If I'd entered invoices twice, what would happen? They were my sales invoices, weren't they, over there? So if I put some invoices in and then I put them in again by accident, then it would make the balance on that account too high. Well, that's exactly what the question's saying. What would explain this account balance being higher than the list? Well, the fact you've put the invoices in twice would make the balance too high. So that is actually correct. And then the last one, discounts allowed, were entered twice in the receivables ledger. So I'm back over here. Whenever I see the phrase receivables ledger, I say list. So I gave, say, A, a discount. And then I accidentally posted the discount again. So the balance on the list is now too low. That's what the question was asking about. So that's also a correct answer. So as we've gone through that, what I've tried to do is just give you a few of my tips and techniques for how I might tackle these. You're probably going to need to do more practice. I'm not suggesting that after this session, everything is just going to be perfect. But hopefully drawing out the T accounts, maybe annotating them a little bit is going to be helpful as a technique when you can now go away and practice some more questions of this style. I'm going to end the recording there. And I will then come back to you with any additional questions. So for anybody watching at home, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you found that session useful. Feel free to tune in for some others.